I think if there's someone from the treasury here, they will be very scared to hear that. It's a very frightening message for some of us because we are probably the most fossil fuel dependent economy in, in Europe. We're going to have a little discussion about that now, so please take your seat. And let me introduce to you um, Hege Norheim, Senior Vice President for Sustainability in Statoil. Vær så god. Now, Hege, are you frightened by the message we've heard now about, you know, getting away from fossils in 25 to 40 years? You do have some investments with a long, li longer sort of lifetime than that, haven't you? Well, let me first say thank you for inviting me up on the stage <laughs> uh, on this great conference and congratulating you with a great conference. Jeremy, you, I, th I assume you missed his speech. Uh, Matt Midas just delivered a very powerful and, and ambitious um, challenge to Norway going forward uh, in Norwegian, which I, I actually thought, and I think, uh, you know, we, we could agree to, uh, to a very large extent, and then there are some very important <laughs> areas where we don't agree. I think, and also, Jeremy, to you, congratulations for the great um, report that you presented a couple of months ago and are touring with now. And I think um, the report that you just alluded to really brings into the conversations that we're having some very uh, important um, dimensions or uh, additional, um, you know, approaches to the, to the discussion we're having in Norway. Because, you know, Marius, in, on top of of the challenge that we're discussing here, how do we change an unsustainable energy system of the world uh, to, to become sustainable for the next 25, 30, 40 years? Mm. We also, at the same time, have to you know, increase that energy system with 50, 60 percent. There is a, an enormous uh, growth in the demand of energy in the world, and that's how, uh, you know, as, a, as a global company that um, Statoil is, is, is de debating um, the challenge. How do we both grow, how do we, how do we provide for the energy of 100 million people going from poverty to middle class every year for the next 30 years, mm. uh, and, and at the same time transform the system into a, a low mm. carbon? And I, and I think it hasn't been mentioned on the stage today either. You know, we've seen th tonight, we saw the announcement of a very important agreement between China and the US mm. on, on how to, on binding an, an agreement on how to reduce, how they are uh, agreeing on reducing emissions. And yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really where we need to also make sure that the solutions lie. Yeah, that's great news because <laughs> they, uh, they are probably the ones who can make the biggest difference. But Jeremy, uh, for a, com for a company like Statoil, and, for, and, the, and we could say for, the, for a country like Norway, heavily invested in, in uh, oil and gas, uh, how can we uh, continue to grow? You know, because the market for fossil fuels will need to slowly start to, to uh, be reduced. How can a company like Statoil be as big as they are today, 40 years from now? How can they transform their business? Well, I, I mean, in all honesty, I, you should probably ask um, <laughs> the, the Hager from Statoil the, that question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not um, here to, to represent kind of what's the right strategy for, for, for Statoil. I mean, I, I would say a couple of things, though. I mean, w one is, I mean, it's clear that um, there will be um, demand for um, uh, gas and oil. 30 years from now. Anyone who thinks that it's going to disappear in the next you know, 30 years, I think is honestly kidding themselves. Um, and Statoil's share of the global market is honestly pretty small, right? So in the great scheme of this, um, uh, even taking climate considerations uh, into account, and especially taking them into account, there is a role for Statoil as a highly efficient, um, really well-managed uh, energy company, oil and gas company, over the next 20 to 30 years, broadly in the businesses that it's in. And those numbers, by the way, you know, the continued use are entirely compatible uh, with getting onto, uh, if you were, a climate secure pathway. But there are, and there, the requirements for that, however, are a couple of things. Um, so one is that we absolutely do need to take a hard, hard line on coal. Um, so that's point one. Second, um, you know, companies that are invested in the oil and gas industry 
will need to have strategies that allow them progressively um, to shift their asset base. Right? It, and, and this is a long-term industry. It's not a short-term industry. So strategies and investment decisions made now start paying out 15, 20 years from now. So I'd love to understand how the, if you will, the resource allocation and the strategies are beginning to shift. Mm -hmm. And third, we need to be absolutely clear. Uh, you know, we will enter a world of greater volatility of hydrocarbon prices, in my view, and any strategy that, that is, is well designed will need to take that into account. Mm -hmm. So which steps are you taking in your company, in Statoil, to transform yourself in order to be able to be maybe an even bigger company in 2050 than you are today? Well, you know, we, we've had the Norwegian shelf, Statoil being big on the Norwegian shelf has a fantastic starting point because we are, as Jeremy is alluding to, the most um, carbon efficient oil and gas producer in the world because Norwegian regulations have been very, very strong for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that's a great starting point. And that means that we've developed technologies that has taken, you know, that makes us very energy efficient and very carbon efficient, which, are we, which we're taking into our assets internationally. Mm -hmm. But I think most importantly, as we all know, is you know, the emissions that you and I create using the oil or the gas. Mm -hmm. That's where you know, the emissions from a, from a barrel of oil, when we produce it, is 10% of the total emissions from that barrel. Mm -hmm. But you and I emit 90% when we use it. So in, if we are going to succeed, it's our use. And that means lower demand for our product. And that's the shift. And I think, so the most important thing that companies uh, like ours have to do is, of course, to make sure that our investments going forward are robust in that world. So for instance, I, and I think all our peers, and we certainly you know, put in a very high carbon price going forward, much higher than what we see today. Statoil uses $50 a ton of CO2 from 2020 and forward for the whole world when we calculate our investments to make them robust for that world where carbon emissions are going to be costly. And also, and we also test on the oil price, of course, mm. to much lower oil prices than, than what we see today. Mm. So what, what are your expectations uh, in the transport sector where most of the oil is consumed? Do you, do you see the, very good question. the technological? You have an electric vehicle yourself, yes, haven't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. We see huge <laughs> changes, uh, obviously. I th and actually, uh, you know, in our, uh, these are all prognoses, and we can debate mm. them. But mm. uh, our prognosis is that we will see an enormous penetration of electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles mm. in the whole world going forward. Actually, we believe that almost every new car, uh, and there will be a lot of new cars, uh, back to mm. the emerging markets growing, mm. um, you know, on the net, uh, they will be of high, uh, you know, t either much more energy efficient or uh, any, you know, hybrids. So that oil demand, we believe, will be about the same in mm. 2030, 20 as today, mm. which means that, however, which is something that people outside the industry don't really remember, our oil fields fall off 6% a year today. Mm. So even if oil demand is flat, because we've had a revolution in the transport market, even if oil demand is flat, f oil fields fall off so much that there is a huge gap just mm. to provide for flat oil demand. Mm. So we see that there is a need for secure energy and carbon efficient uh, mm. oil, oil produ mm. producing. But you, ha you also have, a l in, in your growth strategy until now, mm. you have so specialized in difficult and expensive reserves. Aren't they the first who will sort of leave the market when, when the demand the most starts to fall? Expensive barrels will be the first to fall. Right. Um, and, and so working on the cost base, <laughs> I think people have noticed that we mm. actually are, uh, are at, and, uh, at And maybe get rid of, rid of some assets. And working on technology <laughs> is also <laughs> very important. And, and of course, you know, the, uh, dealing with that yeah. uncertainty is key. Yeah. It's a key thing for an oil company, yeah. it's always been. Jeremy, uh, in the last uh, decade or so, uh, internet has sort of revolutionized a lot of industries, like the media, like the music uh, mu uh, and movie industry. And now we see that solar energy is uh, crashing the business model of utility companies in some markets. How fast do you think consumers will adopt and, and switch from traditional vehicles and onto electrical vehicles, you know, when the time comes when those cars are competitive? How fast do you think these things will change? Look, I, I, I think um, there's, 
all sorts of things that influence consumer behavior. I mean, we all know we sit here with you know, Tesla being having a, a fantastic market share here in, in Norway, and it's in part driven by tax, but in part it's driven by the fact that it's a really cool car, mm. right? And it accelerates super fast, and, and people like that stuff. Um, so I, I think one of the things that we, we, we need to get away from, if you will, you know, how fast will, you know, how, how quickly will, you know, electric vehicles replace, you know, internal combustion engines. What I care about, and I certainly care about this across the world, is, is better mobility for people, right? And the better mobility um, story is a story in which cars play a role mm. um, of different kinds, and there'll mm. be multiple different powertrains. There'll be some people trying out hydrogen, and other people trying out electric, and other people trying out, you know, flex fuel, biodiesel drop-ins. I mean, you name it, people are going to be trying it. And mm. I think one of the messages I'd like to offer is that, that our story and the new climate economy story is a, cho a story of increasing choice. Not reduced choice, um, but more options for consumers. So, so there's options within the thing called cars, but we want options that come out of the world of Uber, and we want options that come out of the world of of better public transport systems. Mm -hmm. And so my story is not a story of whether or not, you know, the electric vehicle gets 3% market share versus internal combustion. I think that's a really boring story, <laughs> right? And it's dull, and we shouldn't get trapped in that, because it becomes a zero-sum story. What we want is a story of dramatic improvements in the mobility opportunities and options for people across the world. And the technologies that are coming through, and the internet is going to be a huge part of that, because mm -hmm. I think it will enable a range of those choices to, to play out in infrastructure poor countries, not just infrastructure rich mm -hmm. ones. And let's get onto that story as opposed to getting stuck in a which kind of car has faster acceleration. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Heg, we, we all, we, we, both of us talk a lot about how to lift people out of poverty with energy. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I know you believe that uh, fossil fuels will need to be a very large part of that, mm -hmm. but uh, you have been to s probably hundreds of climate conferences. Mm -hmm. Are you are you happy with, you know, when you see scenarios where people actually are lifted out of poverty without fossil fuels? Does that, does that make you feel good? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Good and I, I, I do believe there is a lot of opportunity for that to, to sort of free, no, what do you call them, leapfrog uh, mm. uh, fossil fuels in very many places and necessary as well. Mm. Um, and so that's, I think that's absolutely going to happen. Having said that, so I think it's more about back to timing that Jeremy was talking about. I think mm. there, is a, there is a yes to all of the above, except from coal, for a <laughs> while. And then we need to sort of really, sh because of the growth of yes. the world, and then we really need to make the shift. Yeah, that's good to hear. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Vi slipper til verdens rikeste land en liten tur igjen. Vi ses snart.